In the last section, we talked about techniques to evaluate the performance of managers of profit centers. In the rest of this chapter, we will be talking about how to evaluate the performance of managers of investment centers. This is trickier because the manager of an investment center is not only responsible for generating profit, but is also responsible for using the assets under his or her control wisely to generate profit. There are several techniques to evaluate the manager of an investment center. In this section, we will be talking about ROI, return on investment. The formula for ROI is some measure of divisional income divided by some measure of divisional assets. Divisional income could be measured as operating income or if the firm would prefer, it can use after-tax income. Divisional assets could be measured as the beginning balance at the start of the period, the average assets during the period, or the ending balance at the end of the period. In addition, assets could be measured at acquisition cost, depreciated cost, or replacement cost. ROI is the most commonly used measure to evaluate the managers of performance centers because it combines the concept of generating profit from sales with the concept of using assets wisely. Let's take a look at the example that we used in the previous section. Healthy manufactures gym equipment in two divisions, and we have some information about the performance of each division. For the free weights division, we would compute ROI as the divisional income divided by the divisional assets. For the free weights division, that would be its operating income divided by its average assets because that's what this firm has chosen to use, and we get a number, 15%. What that's telling us is that the free weights division generates 15 cents of operating income for each dollar of assets at its disposal. For the treadmills division, we would do the same thing. And we find that the treadmills division generates 18% ROI. In other words, it generates 18 cents of operating profit per dollar of invested assets. Therefore, we can conclude that the treadmills division is better at generating operating profit per dollar of invested assets than the free weights division. The problem with this is that it doesn't tell us why these two divisions are performing differently. There are two possibilities. One possibility is that the treadmill division is better at generating profit out of each dollar of sales, and the other possibility is that the treadmill division is better at using its assets to generate profit. Let's see if we can take those two issues apart and figure out why the treadmill division is performing better. To do this, we're going to use what's called the DuPont expansion. In this method, we're going to take our formula for ROI and we're going to multiply it by 1. 
we know if we multiply something by one, it doesn't change its value. The formula for one that I'm going to use is divisional sales over divisional sales. So I haven't changed the value of ROI, but now I can rearrange the denominator. I can say that ROI is divisional income divided by sales times divisional sales divided by divisional assets. And I can do this because we know that multiplication is commutative. That is, it doesn't matter the order that you multiply things. And we can see that we haven't changed the value of our ROI formula because we can cancel out divisional sales in the numerator and in the denominator, and we get back our original equation. But this expansion is very useful to us because each of these ratios has a meaning of its own. Divisional income divided by divisional sales is the profit margin ratio. And we could base this either on operating income or after-tax income, as we discussed before. What it's going to tell us is the extent of the division's ability to control its costs at a particular level of revenue. In other words, how many pennies of income the division manages to keep per dollar of sales. If we see that the profit margin ratio is decreasing, that would suggest to us that the division is having trouble controlling its costs. The other ratio, divisional sales divided by divisional assets, is called the asset turnover ratio. And it relates to the division's ability to use its invested assets to generate sales revenue. If we see that that ratio is decreasing, that would suggest to us that the division needs to consider whether it is using its invested assets in the best way. Remember, those assets really belong to the shareholders. So let's take a look at these two ratios for healthy. The formula for the profit margin ratio is operating income divided by sales revenue. For the free weights division, that works out to 6%. In other words, the free weights division is keeping six cents of operating profit out of each sales dollar. By contrast, the treadmill division is keeping three cents out of each sales dollar. We computed these ratios in the previous section for this chapter. So, what do we learn from these ratios? We see that the free weights division is better at holding on to more pennies out of each sales dollar. What about the asset turnover ratio. The formula is sales divided by assets. For the free weights division, we take its sales revenue, divide by its divisional assets, and we get a number, 2.50. In other words, the free weights division is generating $2.50 of sales revenue for each dollar of assets that the manager has under his or her control. For the treadmills division, we divide its sales revenue by its divisional assets and we get a number 
point zero. In other words, the treadmill division is generating six dollars of sales per dollar of divisional assets. Altogether, we can say that the treadmill division is better at using its assets to generate sales revenue. So, let's compare the two divisions. We already know that we can compute ROI as income divided by assets, but we can also compute it as the profit margin ratio times the asset turnover ratio. For the free weights division, we take its 6% profit margin ratio, multiply it by its $2.50 asset turnover ratio, and we get 15%. In other words, altogether, the free weights division generates 15 cents of profit for each dollar of assets. The treadmill division had a profit margin ratio of 3% and an asset turnover ratio of $6 of sales revenue per dollar of invested assets. When we multiply those together, we get 18% ROI. The treadmill division generates 18 cents of operating profit for each dollar of assets at its disposal. So what's that telling us? It says that the free weights division is better at controlling its costs and keeping pennies out of each sales dollar compared to the treadmill division. However, the treadmill division is better at generating sales revenue from its invested assets. Altogether, because the treadmill division is so much better at using its assets to generate sales, it ended up with a higher ROI. Now, return on investments is very commonly used for a couple of reasons. Number one, we can compute it from data that's already available to us. And number two, it's very easy to compute and to interpret. However, it has some serious disadvantages. Number one, it encourages managers to focus on the short term. That is, it only measures recent actions and it ignores long-term expenditures like investing in research and development or advertising. Number two, it tends to be a lagging indicator. That is, it tells us about what the firm has done, but it does not tell us how well the firm is going to do going forward. However, the most serious limitation of ROI is that it may encourage managers to make decisions that will improve their division's performance at the expense of overall firm performance. Let me give you an example. Let's say that the treadmill division has an opportunity to expand and it has estimated that the expansion will cost $10 million and the operating income increase that should result from the expansion is $1,700,000. Will the treadmill manager choose to expand? Well, the manager knows that his or her bonus is dependent on ROI. So, the manager calculates, what is my ROI with no expansion? It's 18%. What is the ROI of the expansion? That would be the income from the expansion 
divided by the assets that would be used for the expansion. And the manager would find that the return on the expansion itself is 17%. That means that expanding would lower the manager's batting average because the ROI of the expansion is less than the current ROI. And we can see this if we combine the two, if we take total income that the manager already has plus the expansion and divide by total assets that the manager would have if the division expands. And the result is 17.66%. Choosing to expand would make the treadmill division's manager have a lower ROI than choosing not to expand. Thus, the manager would choose not to expand. But what would the firm as a whole want the manager to do? Let's take a look. We can compute the total firm's ROI without the expansion. That would be the income from both divisions as they stand now divided by the assets from both divisions. And if we crank that out, we come out with an overall firm ROI of 16.857%. What if the treadmill division manager expanded? We already know that the ROI of the expansion is 17%. That means that even though the expansion lowers the treadmill division manager's overall ROI, it would increase the firm's ROI. And we can see that by computing the ROI for the firm overall with the expansion. We can take the firm's income without the expansion and add in the income from the expansion and we can do the same for assets. And when we crank that out, we find that with the expansion, the firm's ROI actually goes up. So would the firm want the treadmill division to invest in this expansion? And the answer is maybe. It depends. And what it depends on is whether this is the highest use that the firm has for that $10 million. If they have a use that would generate more than a 17% return, maybe they would prefer to do that. But if this is the best use of the money, then ROI has created a moral hazard for the manager of the treadmill division because the manager's personal incentives are now different from what the firm would want the manager to do. We will be talking about how to solve this moral hazard in the next two sections.